this feels very strange for lots of reasons, but you are most welcome. For some of you, this will be your first sight of St Thomas's since the recent reordering work. And I hope you like what you see, though there are still a few finishing touches to be put. And this isn't quite how we imagine the seating being laid out eventually. Nor is this the grand reopening we'd envisaged. <clears throat> but I hope, but I can't let this moment pass without expressing my thanks to God and to the team led by Jamie and Mandy for steering the project through. And they were reflecting again this week how we've seen God's hand at every stage of the project, in the timing, in the provision of finances, and solutions to problems. <coughs> it's 13 months since people have met for public worship in this building, four since we've done so anyway. That raises interesting questions. Is going to church just a habit, which, having gone out of, it may be hard to get back into? Is it even desirable simply to go back to the old pattern? Evidence from America, even after a shorter lockdown, is that many have not returned to public worship, though there may be other reasons for that, fear that it's not safe, for instance. So there are questions that we'll all need to think seriously about over the coming months. <clears throat> Which old habits do we want to recover? Which are we better off without? Are there new habits we've developed over the last four months we want to continue? Digital ones, perhaps. Which other habits do we want to maintain? And which can we now let go of? And on the subject of habits, good and bad, some may feel that all the hygiene and social distancing measures we're taking, in line with Government and Church of England advice, are a little bit over the top. Surely the risk of us gathering here is very small. Well, like a lot of what we've done over the last four months, I think it's about being responsible citizens creating and reinforcing habits which will protect everyone, even if it means keeping the rules when the risk is very small. Well, although this isn't quite what any of us expected the reopening of St Thomas's after over a year to be like, I hope that rather than lamenting that there are only a few of us, two metres apart, with no singing or handshakes or hugs, we can see this as an opportunity. For instance, to reconnect with our liturgical roots or discover them for the first time. Saying psalms rather than singing songs. Praying prayers honed over centuries rather than extemporary ones. Enjoying being together quietly and reflectively rather than exuberantly and noisily. We've rightly revelled in the freshness and spontaneity of our worship in the past, but perhaps for a while God is inviting us to rediscover some older treasures alongside those new ones. So we begin our worship. Let us pray. Almighty God, we praise you for the many blessings you have given to those who worship you in this house of prayer. And we pray that all who seek you in this place may find you, and being filled with the Holy Spirit, may become a living temple acceptable to you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gateway of heaven. I saw a ladder which rested on the ground, with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were going up and down it. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gateway of heaven. You will 
see greater things than this. You will see heaven wide open and God's angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gateway of heaven. You are the temple of the living God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. The temple of God is holy, and you are the temple. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gateway of Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you, that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. It's a sadness to us all that we can't, at the moment, sing God's praises in this building. But we can do what Christians have done for many centuries and our Jewish predecessors did for even centuries before that. We praise God by saying the Psalms responsibly. The earth is the Lord's and all that fills it. Come to us, the Lord, and all the world in him. For he has founded it upon the seas, and set it firm upon the rivers of the deep. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Or who can rise up in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart. Who have not lifted up their soul to an idol, nor sworn an oath to an honor. They shall receive a blessing from the Lord, a just reward from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek Him, of those who seek your face, God of your victory. Lift up your heads, O gates, be lifted up. Genesis 28, starting at verse 10. Jacob left Bathsheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to the heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! 
This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel. Psalm 122. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. And now our feet are standing within your gates of Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city that is at unity in itself. Thither the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord as is decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. There are set the thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David, who pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, and tranquility within your houses. For my kindred and companions sake, I will pray that peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek to do you good. Our second reading is from John chapter 1. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite, in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree, before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's be quiet for a moment as we open ourselves to hear God speak to us through his word. Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. By one of those happy coincidences, that passage from Genesis 28 is one of the set readings for today, the day we've re-entered this house of God. And it prompts us to ask, what or where is the house of God on earth? 
A brief tour of scripture reveals many meanings for that phrase, house of God. I have no problem at all calling this building, or Holy Trinity, or St John's, Houses of God. Places set apart where prayer and worship has continued almost uninterrupted, until recently, for 150 years or more. So today, albeit in slightly muted tones, we can echo Psalm 122. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. But it wasn't an ecclesiastical structure, grand or simple, that moved Jacob to utter those words we've just heard. For him, an earth bed and a stone pillow became Bethel, the house of God the gate of heaven. Just as the plains of Canaan and the wide starlit sky had been for his grandfather Abraham. From the time of David onwards for the nation of Israel, the temple in Jerusalem was the unique dwelling of God on earth. A place of longing which exerted a huge emotional pull and left them devastated when it was destroyed, first by the Babylonians, and then later by the Romans. Then, for Jesus' followers, re reared on regular synagogue attendance and occasional visits to the temple, the fields, hills and villages around the Sea of Galilee unexpectedly became the house of God. And I'm sure Jacob's words would have resonated with them. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. Yet another concept of God's house emerges in the New Testament epistles. You, singly and corporately, are the household of God, the temple. Wherever God lives in or among his people, by the Spirit, is now his dwelling place on earth. A temple and priesthood not made with human hands, but out of human lives. And then, in recent months, we've discovered yet another new meaning. Our computer screens, TVs and living rooms can also be the house of God. Maybe we knew that already, but lockdown has dramatically brought it home in a way that will change church forever. Finally, on a personal note, last week I was very thankful to be able to visit the Lake District somewhere I have a huge emotional attachment to, because over the years, that landscape has often been a Bethel, a meeting place with God, a gate of heaven for me. So the house of God is all those places and many more. I don't have any problem calling this the house of God, but would never want to limit the concept to that. The last four months have shown that church can exist perfectly well without buildings, however useful they may be. Wherever God makes his presence known, wherever Jesus meets with his people, wherever the Holy Spirit fills human hearts and lives, that is the house of God on earth. And Jacob's words apply in all those settings. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And then Jesus adds another dimension in John's Gospel where he deliberately echoes Genesis 28 and calls Nathanael a true Israelite, a true descendant of Jacob, 
and says to him and us, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Just like Jacob's stairway between heaven and earth. So wherever God's presence dwells, whether it's in the lives of his people, in the beauty of creation, in a service streamed on the internet, or in the sacred building like this, that can be the gate of heaven, the place where people see Jesus and are drawn by his love into his family. As the COVID pandemic continues to affect all our lives, let's pray that God will use all those different expressions of the house of God to bring people home to him. And let's pray that many will be able to say, whoever and wherever they are, surely the Lord is in this place. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. from Psalm 84, verse 1. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul has a desire and longing to enter the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh rejoice in the living God. Lord, we pray for congregations re-entering their church buildings at this time with mixed emotions of joy and sorrow for what has been lost and what is being regained, and for the new things you are doing. We pray for all who are still shielding or who do not yet wish to return to public worship, and for churches which are still unable to meet for practical or logistical reasons. And we pray for all who have begun to feel a connection to your church through its many online expressions, that those links will not be lost, but will grow into the full knowledge of your Son, Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Pray for world leaders' continuing response to COVID-19 and all the challenges it has brought. For our own Prime Minister and Government, our Queen and Royal Family, for the UN and not-for-profit organisations grappling with the implications of the pandemic worldwide. We continue to pray for doctors, nurses, paramedics and care workers, particularly where they are still under great pressure. And we pray for the research teams continuing to seek vaccines and treatments for this disease. Lord, prosper the work of their hands. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Pray for businesses and services beginning to return to normal. For teachers and students having a much needed break. For the travel industry and those who are able to get away. Praying that wise precautions will be taken to ensure the safety of both holidaymakers and locals. And we pray for businesses having to restructure with the additional pressures falling on management, workers facing redundancy or an uncertain future, and all who may lose livelihoods or suffer as a result of recession. 
and we pray for a swift economic upturn. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Pray for those known to us who are sick, in hospital, bereaved, anxious or exhausted, that they may find a place of healing and peace in your presence. And we remember those who have recently died with sorrow and gratitude, praying for grace to follow their good examples. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time, with one accord, to make our common supplications unto thee. And dost promise that where two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfil now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. And we join together in the traditional version of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Do feel free to sit quietly for a moment or two, and then you're asked to make your way out through the back door rather than the one you came in by. Christ, whose glory is in the heavens, fill this house and illuminate your hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Amen. 